Good afternoon. Hopefully ha everyone had a wonderful lunch. Uh, we have our first breakout session of the conference. We're going to have a wonderful presentation from Effective UI and Scott Trade talking about understanding the customer journey and its uh, importance like we've been talking about today. Scott Trade is doing some very unique things in that regard and their partner is Effective UI in this journey and look forward to hearing the presentation. And also, we have the text to screen, uh, text no to 53016 and we'll prompt questions and I can bring the questions up or we can do at the end of the session. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon everyone. We'll try to keep this lively because I know this is the first post-lunch presentation of the day. My name's Gina Bowalker and I'm Assistant Vice President of User Experience and Accessibility at Scott Trade. And my name's Lise Maitland. I'm a Senior User Experience Designer at Effective UI. And today we're going to be talking to you about understanding the customer journey when segmentation isn't enough. But before we get into that, I'm required by the legal folks at Scott Trade to present you with this brief and exciting slide of disclosures that <laughs> you may choose to read if you wish. <laughs> but in the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> just a little bit about Scott Trade for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We're a privately held company consisting of Scott Trade Inc., Scott Trade Bank, and Scott Trade Investment Management. And we were founded back in 1980. Um, originally, we started out as a discount brokerage. Um, you may know us for $7 trades. That was kind of our tagline for a while. And we used to really cater to traders. And now our customers are really kind of the full spectrum of investors, all the way from active traders to long-term buy and hold investors. Our company's mission is to improve lives by helping people overcome barriers to financial success. And that mission statement isn't just words on a page to us. We really do try to live it out day in and day out. And one of the main ways that we do that is by seeking to really understand who our customers are and apply that great data and research to developing better products and services. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. We're headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, and we have about 3,600 associates nationwide across our headquarters and our 500 plus investment branches. So Effective UI is a user experience focused technology agency, and we help our clients adapt technology and services to human behavior. Our services include customer insight, like we've done for Scott Trade, strategy, experience design, and um, software engineering. So why did we take on this research effort that we're here to talk to you about today? Well, about a year ago at Scott Trade, we were in a situation where our existing client segmentation models just weren't telling us enough about our customers. They were very firmly rooted and well understood throughout our organization, which was good, but they were completely quantitative in nature. So what those models didn't tell us is anything about our clients' mindsets, needs, emotions, um, environments, all the things that customer experience professionals like us really create to know, right? So I wanted to change that. Second, we had personas um, for our clients Sort of, but they were very project level, so they were really specific to a given product, and they also were largely based on assumptions. So what we wanted was client personas that were really grounded in research. Number three is we'd planted the seed for doing this type of research uh, for several months, and we finally got to a point where we got buy-in from our leadership to invest the time to create personas and journey maps, and they were really excited about it. So it was the right time to get started. And then lastly, we were very selective in terms of who we would partner with to do this type of research effort. Um, we spent a lot of time looking for a partner, and we wanted someone who really had expertise in the type of research required to create these types of artifacts, um, but also shared the same collaborative work style that we really value at Scott Trade. And we found that partner in Effective UI. So today, um, I'm going to first hand it over to Lise to talk to you about the project we took on together. And the high-level goal for this project was to learn more about our clients and then represent those learnings in a set of personas and journey maps that we could really put to work within our organization. So Liz will talk about, or Lise will talk about how we got that started. All right. So in order to design an effective study, you have to know who you're working with and you need to gather all of the existing research that they already have. We met with the core team early and we realized that they were really an exemplary team. Uh, they were committed to being involved in the research every step of the way. 
They were enthusiastic to see the findings and they really understood how they wanted to use that research when they actually finally got it. And then they were also steadfast in their belief that the research findings would be used past the original scope of what the, plan, what the project was supposed to be doing. They really felt like it would have a wider purpose in their company. And then we also conducted stakeholder interviews. And that's when we really started to look at what the needs and interests are of the people outside of the Core UX team. We really had to understand what their attitudes were and their appetite for this type of qualitative data. Um, we needed to understand what they hoped to see out of the research as well as um, what barriers to acceptance the research might, in, might, might encounter at Scott Trade. So from these interviews and meetings, uh, we discovered both how we needed to work with Scott Trade and also how we needed to communicate with them. And then we also dove into the existing research and we really looked into and we figured out that Scott Trade is a very numbers driven company and they have a lot of quantitative data to prove it. And they knew the what, but not the why. So we designed the study to validate and build on the existing research and the client segmentation they were already working with. So during the research, we set out to understand their mindset, the emotional experience, the environment, the financial goals, as well as the explicit and latent needs of their customers when they were investing and trading. We really wanted to understand what their expectations of Scott Trade were, as well as their needs across different channels and financial service providers. Uh, we were looking for the moments of truth for their customers in their investing and in in investing and trading lives. And all of this data fed into the personas and the journey maps that we created. So we looked at the, we looked at Scott Trade, um, we looked at the experience of their clients very broadly and then how Scott Trade fit into their experience. And to do this, we engaged in a three month research project. We had 36 interviews that were two hours apiece across three different cities and it took about three weeks to actually con conduct all of these interviews. So when we were in the field with them, we observed participants in their own environments. We asked questions to elicit stories and, um, and really get to the rich data about their investing and trading lives. And we observed them performing actual tasks and using their own tools. And this is important because you get a different level of data when you actually see people in their own environment performing their own tasks than when you ask them survey questions or when you are even asking them questions over the phone. We were in many bedrooms, living rooms, a few offices, and people were really, really generous with us. Um, they opened up their homes and they truly shared what it meant to them to be involved in investing and trading. And they even shared their pets. <laughs> we met a lot of cats and dogs, so it's a very good thing that we are animal lovers. So the core team was incredibly enthusiastic about uh, being involved in every aspect of the research. And this actually dovetails really nicely with the fact that Effective UI encourages our clients to, be, uh, to participate in the research. We really feel that witnessing interviews has a big impact in how they accept the findings, as well as how they can incorporate any of the findings into their own organizations. So the core team divided the interviews, um, uh, they divided them up and they each spent a couple days with us on the road. So collectively, they all lived through all of the research that we conducted. And they were therefore better equipped to take all of this information back and really bring the personas to life for the other people at Scott Trade. So how do you share stories like this with team members who are not there in the field with you, and especially the larger stakeholder team? Um, but then that's really where storytelling becomes incredibly important. So after each interview, we turned the inter interviews into data as quickly as possible. We did a very formal debrief process, which allowed us to create these postcards. So each one of these postcards gave a really nice high level about who this participant was, what they're interested in, is what, what types of investing and trading they did, and what was really important to them. And this is really important because we needed to keep the core UX team engaged in, in the process because we were out in the field for three weeks and they needed to know what was going on. And it was also a really good tool for them to use to circulate stories internally so that they could really um, engage the stakeholders and the senior leadership to help generate excitement for the upcoming personas that we were creating. And all of the examples that we're showing are not actual examples. They say more MIPSUM and whatnot because we can't show the, the actual documents. <laughs> um, so with the interviews completed, 
and our initial analysis began. Uh, we visited Scott Trade for a workshop to share our initial findings and persona frameworks with the larger stakeholder group. And part of this research was a story selling, telling session where we had every one of the core UX team members who were on the interviews pick a participant and tell the story of that particular person to this larger group. So we ended up with about seven stories being told. And this activity is really important because it helps bring to life all the behaviors, the motivations, and the goals that we were drawing from to create the personas. And one of the interesting things is when you do this sort of research, a lot of the time people have ideas about their clients and their customers, and your research might go against what their, what their ingrained feelings are. And so it's really important that they see this data firsthand and start to realize that this is the landscape of their clients instead of just seeing the final end piece and then reacting against that, going, no, that's not what I believe. So we were, after going through this activity, we were able to then walk through the persona framework with them, with the larger stakeholder team, and we, they, we could talk with them and understand where they saw value in the personas and where we needed to make the data a lot more explicit and pull it up so that it was more useful to them. And the reason that we did this is that these are the people that were going to be using the personas. These are the people who were going to have to take them into their organization and make them successful. And if we didn't have their buy-in and we didn't have their, um, their participation in this process, there is a le much less likelihood of them being successful. So we had about five to six weeks to complete the analysis and synthesis and create the personas and journey maps. We had 36 interviews, and the transcripts were 60 to 80 pages apiece. That's 2,500 pages of data to comb through. And from that, we pulled out about 4,000 data points that we had to analyze that went into making the personas and the journey maps. You can see pictures of our workspace up here on the left is um, where we took all those postcards and we did participant clustering of characteristics, and that's when we started creating the initial framework of the personas. And the one on the right is actually the journey map prototyped in sticky notes. We estimate that we used about 1,000 sticky notes to prototype the journey map, and we actually had a whole other whiteboard as well. And as you can see, this is a really long process, and a lot of thought goes into creating deliverables like this. And it, it took us, you know, we had about three or five weeks where we were working on that, and we needed to ensure that the core team members never wondered what we were doing. We had to make sure that we never went dark. Um, so whenever we had a scrap of information that was big enough for them to understand, we shared it with them. We took pictures, close-ups of these sorts of things. We shared any sketches, any prototypes we had for the journey maps, any visual design, anything that we had. We were posting it to a collaboration site, and then we had regularly scheduled calls where we, um, where we talked about the progress of the work and got their feedback on it. So all of this collaboration really reduced any of the big surprises or big reveals. And what's important about that is there's no point to a big reveal if it's going to fall flat on its face. And the Scott Trade core team members were aware of and contributed to the thinking that went behind the, content, the creation of all of these deliverables. And this point is key. They needed to have this level of understanding because they were the ones that were going to take it back to Scott Trade and make it work within the So after all of this amazing collaboration, what did we produce? Well, the personas and journey maps are a composite view of Scott Trade's customers based on the qualitative interviews that we conducted. There's absolutely no made-up data in any of it. It's all based on research. We tied every word, phrase, feeling, thought, image back to actual data. So the persona framework allows you to look at your customer's experience through the eyes of your customer. And why make a persona? Well, they're a stand-in for a unique group of people who have a common experience, but they might come from widely different and demographic background. Um, and they also help create empathy for the different needs and behaviors and mindsets of, of your clients. So, um, like I said earlier, we can't show you the actual documents, but this is the actual structure. And as you can see with the persona we created at the top, there's a quote that really exemplifies what that person felt about uh, trading and investing, and then a narrative that showed you what it meant to them through their eyes. Uh, an example of their routine, what they would go through on a daily or weekly basis, their goals, their motivations, 
their key thoughts and feelings, their main focus. So there's a lot of information in this persona, but what's most important is that it's a tool that, uh, to share the, comp the composite story of the personas. And it helps Scott Trade develop empathy design tools specifically for this person and not go into the self-referential design of thinking, oh, I'd really like this, so I think it should be in there. But they could go back and say, this is a tool we're designing for Owen. Does this work for Owen? So this is an example of one of the journey maps. And journey maps enable teams to understand the motivation, the activities, the emotional experience, and the needs of customers through each stage of the journey. And so journey maps are a really great tool to help improve the customer experience. They visualize the journey and they're, direct, they're based directly on what the customers are thinking and doing and experiencing. Uh, this one is uh, an example of one stage of the journey and across the top are the personas with their triggers, their influences and their goals for what they're trying to accomplish in this journey. And then down below is what they're doing. And you can see the little red dots. So those are all the pain points that Gina will be talking about later. And the green dots are the high emotional points. And then down below in the next lane, you can see the thinking and feeling. And that's where we really were pulling out what, they, what their experiences were as they were going through this stage in the journey. And the last swim lane provides the opportunities. So that gave us a chance to really say, what are the things that we can do to help make the lives of Scott Trade customers better in each through each stage of the journey? And in a typical situation when we deliver documents like this, we maybe hear a little bit of information. We know that they, they get used in strategy and they get used uh, to help develop tools. But I think I'm safe to say that most of the journey maps and personas that we create do not get the star treatment that Gina and her team have afforded these. Michelle, tell you a little bit more. All right, thanks, Lise. Yes, so we were so excited to have personas and journey maps. Um, we didn't have these before at Scott Trade, so it really opened up doors for us to do a lot of new things and start making decisions in a better way. Um, but before we could do that, we had to first begin by just getting the word out about who our client personas are um, and what their journey is. And we did that through a kind of large socialization effort that I'm gonna walk you through today. My goal in socializing these personas and journey maps was to get to a point where everyone at Scott Trade, whether they were a designer, a developer, or senior vice president, was referring to these personas by names in meetings and actually using them to influence the decisions that they make. And we poured a lot of time into trying to make that happen. So I'll walk you through kind of our strategy for that today. First of all, what we did not do was go just start shouting from the rooftops of Scott Trade, you know, hey, everyone, check out these great new personas we have, and putting cardboard cutouts of them around the buildings. Um, that wasn't the right approach for us. We took a very strategic and tailored approach to how we rolled these out. We started with teams that we knew could immediately apply personas to their daily work. Um, our UX team, for example. They were just waiting for these so they could use personas to inform design. They were easy in that respect. So we started with them, made them our champions, and they helped get the word out for us from there. We were also very deliberate in terms of who we didn't socialize the personas with. Um, for example, we have over 2,000 investment consultants out in the field, and they had a very sales-based model that they had already been trained to use to think about our clients. And so we didn't want to add confusion to that. So my point here is we were just very deliberate in terms of who we socialized to and when. We also tailored how we delivered the personas and journey maps to different teams. So what we would do is we would set up a 90 minute session with each team and we would first introduce them to the persona and journey map artifacts. We then encouraged and answered any questions that they had about them. And then we engaged in an interactive discussion to talk about how they could apply these to their daily work. So I'll just give you one example. Um, we met with our content strategy team and we talked to them about how they could use that thinking and feeling portion of the journey map that Lise showed you a moment ago to write messaging that really kind of capitalizes on some of those positive emotions that certain personas feel during a given phase in the journey. And we would do a similar exercise with, with each team. So we poured a lot of time into taking that approach, as you can see, um, but that was time very well spent. Um, and it really helped people understand how to use these effectively. 
after we did those initial intro presentations with all the teams at Scott Trade, we then worked on just getting our personas out into the environment. So um, who drinks coffee? Okay, everyone drinks coffee, right? So I noticed people were always carrying these Scott Trade logo mugs to coffee, you know, to meetings um, with their morning coffee. And I thought, what if they were carrying the personas instead? Wouldn't that be a great way to get the word out? So what we did is we created a mug for each of our five client personas. So this is Andrea. Um, the first time I took my Andrea mug to a meeting, someone asked me if I had my mom's picture on my coffee mug, um, and I said no, <laughs> but that's our persona, Andrea, and why don't we talk a little bit about her? So it really opened up the door for some neat conversations with personas. We also got journey maps out and the way we did that is we created an interactive customer experience gallery. So we blew up the journey map, large scale version, and we hung it outside our lobby, so very high foot traffic area. And every week we would post new instructions for how people could interact with the map. So in the example you see here on the slide, we instructed people to use sticky notes to annotate the map with either projects they were working on or ideas that they had to alleviate the different customer pain points on the journey. And that worked really well. Um, it was kind of hard to miss it because it was right by the lobby, um, and it really did pique people's curiosity and encourage them to engage with the journey. We also wanted to just find ways for people to keep the personas top of mind when they were making that design decision at their desk or writing that piece of content. And so we printed our personas on mouse pads because we figured it'd be kind of hard to ignore the personas if they're right there under your nose. And we found that this was also really effective in terms of making people um, consider the unique needs of all five personas, not just the primary one that they may be focused on in their area. Another strategy, probably my favorite, was we tried to tap into people's emotions. So what we did is we wrote letters from our person them to vice presidents across the company anonymously, just kind of left it in their office, so it was a little creepy. <laughs> um, but we instructed them to read these letters at their department meetings. And in each letter, the persona would touch on both the good and the bad. So what they enjoyed about doing business with Scott Trade, but also what their pain points are and what they were asking that department to specifically help with. And we found that this really helped people empathize with the personas um, by kind of tapping into them at, at that emotional level. We had a lot of fun. Again, first time. So we were having fun getting the word out with them. Um, we did things like we designed a Jeopardy game where we tested people's knowledge of the personas by asking them questions about the persona's routine, wish lists, matters of the heart, et cetera. And this worked out better than I anticipated. Um, we actually saw people studying and quizzing each other in the days leading up to the game. Now, granted, a prize was at stake, <laughs> but I also like to think that people just, you know, really enjoyed seeing who knew the personas better, kind of brought out that competitive uh, spirit, which was really nice. And then lastly, um, we also uh, would do things like skits. So our user experience team had a lot of fun with this. Um, around the time of the Alibaba IPO, was anyone following that in the news? A few of you? Great. Um, so we were talking about it a lot at Scott Trade, and so we thought it would be interesting to have our five personas react to what was going on with the IPO. So the scene was set in a cafe, and they were all just talking about the news around Alibaba. And it was neat because, of course, all of our five personas came at it from a very different angle because they had different mindsets and different needs. And people just got a really great laugh out of it. So you, can, you know, never underestimate the power of things like this um, to help solidify understanding through a little bit of entertainment. So to summarize, I'd like to share my three do's and three don'ts as far as socializing personas and journey maps throughout your organization. First of all, make sure to clarify how personas are to be used, how they differ from segmentation models. So we were a segmentation-heavy organization. People understood it, and they didn't understand personas. So I made sure that any time I introduced the personas to a team, I also talked about our client segments and how they are to be used differently. That was very important. 
Also, do be thoughtful in terms of who you socialize these artifacts with first. Um, I guarantee you there's people who are craving these, and if you can get them on board and make them your champions, they can help you out from there. And then number three, do find creative, culturally appropriate ways to get personas and journey maps out into your environment. Um, I've heard of companies um, doing really neat things like creating mock homes um, for their personas to kind of illustrate what that persona's space is like and how their brand fits into that. And I always thought those were really neat, but I knew coming into this effort that wasn't gonna be the most culturally appropriate way to do it at Scott Trade. So we did things like mugs and mouse pads instead. Um, the point here is find what works for you, but make sure to get them out there. Don't employ a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, really tailor your delivery of these artifacts to different teams um, to make sure that they understand how they can specifically apply them to their area. Also, don't forget about new hires. So what a better time to teach people about your personas than when they're walking in the door, right? So one of the things we did for this is we're actually developing a client 101 course that's gonna be offered as part of employee onboarding where we will teach people about the personas and actually have them go through exercises to understand how that should impact their role in their department. So that's just one idea there. And then lastly, don't share these once and expect that they'll take hold. Um, I definitely recommend continuing to resurface these and re-engage employees with your personas and journey maps in new and interesting ways. And with that, so once we would gotten the word out about the personas and the journey maps and taught people how to use them, then we could really start formally making these a part of our decision you know, making process. So I'll talk to you about a few ways that we did that. We started with our user design process. Um, you can only imagine if anyone, is anyone in here a UX designer or part of a UX team? No, okay. Um, UX designers really want personas to be able to guide their design process. So when we had these, we immediately could start applying them. Um, but we wanted to be very explicit because we wanted to make sure that all of our designers across the company knew how to use these appropriately. So you'll see here, we explicitly updated our design process with here's where you should be leveraging personas and journey maps. And I'll give you just a couple specific examples of that now. So we create design briefs whenever we start a project. And one of the elements that we were now able to add to those briefs was the identification of our primary and secondary personas. You see that kind of in the middle of the design brief on the left. And then we got all the stakeholders together for the project, and we would have them write elevator pitches for each persona. And this elevator pitch is a really neat tool that Effective UI actually recommended to us. And it really makes the stakeholder think from the client's perspective, what does success look like? So we the stakeholder complete that, share them with one another, and then we would consolidate them into one elevator pitch that ends up in the design brief, kind of serves as our guide throughout the project. And this, again, was just a really great tool to get people to not just say, here's the revenue outcome or the number of trades or number of logins that I want to see as a result of this project, but it was more, here's what I want Andrea to say about us at the end of this project. And that was a really powerful thing. Um, second, we created this tool for tying pain points to requirements. So what we would do is we would take each uh, feature within the scope of a project and we would have stakeholders map those features to the pain points from the journey map for that phase of the journey that project applies to. And this would do things like help us understand if we succeed, here's the pain points that we should be alleviating, but it would also identify new opportunities. So if we were implementing a feature that didn't address a pain point, then why are we prioritizing that feature? Those are the types of conversations this would spark. In addition to updating our design process, another way we put our journey maps and personas to work was by prioritizing our pain points. So the research that Effective I did yielded 55 client points along the journey, 55. So we had a lot of pain to deal with. <laughs> um, my boss refers to this as the day where I locked everyone in a room and all we did was talk about pain all day long. 
But we really needed to do that because we needed to think through each pain point and say things like, what personas does this most impact? What's the priority? Um, what projects are we doing that should help with this? And what projects should we be doing? And we pulled that all into this spreadsheet that has now served as the basis for our pain point tracker. Um, and this is our mechanism for making sure we're staying on top of our pain points, celebrating successes, but also recognizing when there's you know, additional problems that we need to elevate to our leadership. Another way we put these to work was we would use personas and journey maps to inform future state experience mapping exercises. So we do a lot of future state experience mapping when we're designing a new product or service. And what we can now do with these artifacts is create that experience, design it through the lens of our persona Andrea, for example. And we consider things like Andrea's pain points and Andrea's key emotional moments as we go through and map out that future state journey. And so this has been a really good way for me to help encourage our leaders to get in a room and design from a client-centric standpoint using these great artifacts that we now have. So all of this is great. We were able to put personas and journey maps to work in a variety of ways, but we also had to recognize what we don't know. So this research effort we did was very broad. We didn't drill extremely deep into any one area. And so it quickly became apparent that before we could really put these artifacts to work with our mobile teams, that we needed to uncover more about our clients' mobile moments and their behaviors as it pertains to mobile devices. So we're actually doing a follow-on piece of work with Effective UI right now to understand more about those mobile moments specifically and add that additional layer to our personas and to our maps. So my point here is you're always going to have additional research questions. You can't just do a study like this once and expect that will be it. Um, it's good to keep learning and to keep evolving personas and journey maps over time. And that's something that we're trying to do right now. So with that, I'll just summarize um, the four key ways um, that we're putting personas and journey maps to work. Number one, um, use them to update your design process and evolve your design deliverables. Number two, go through that exercise of prioritizing your pain points. It takes time and there's a lot to discuss, um, but it's really critical in terms of making sure you can stay on top of those and track how you're doing over time. Number three, um, use personas and journey maps to inform future experiences that you design. That's probably one of the biggest values to having these. Um, and we've seen a lot of success in terms of that also creating just very client-centric thinking with our leaders. And then lastly, recognize what you don't know. Um, keep learning and keep evolving these deliverables over time. So with that, we're gonna leave you with five final words of advice if you are currently or are thinking of taking on a project like this in the future. So the first one is understand how the research is going to be used because that is actually going to greatly inform how you set up the study as well as what deliverables you're creating and what information you're putting into the deliverables. Uh, the second is be patient with the process. It takes time. Uh, we have a lot of clients who, once we finish the interviews, they are very hot to get all the information, but it takes a while to actually comb through all that data and actually analyze and turn it into something meaningful that you can share. Uh, number three, keep reintroducing your personas in new ways and find ways to have fun with it as well. Number four, really make sure to put your personas and journey maps to work. I've worked at companies in the past where personas sat on a shelf, and I was determined to make sure that didn't happen at Scott Trade, because it does, it's an investment to do this research. So put them to work um, and make sure that you are using them to drive decisions. And then number five, um, I can't underestimate the importance of also just picking a right partner. Um, we were very picky about who we would work with, being UX people ourselves. Um, and we needed someone that had the same work style and would keep us involved along the way. And along those lines, be sure to stay involved in the research because you have to know it, you have to take it back to your organization and make it work in your company. And with that, um, I want to thank you all for your time today and we'll take any questions. Yes. Yep. 
so we have shared them with vendors. Um, we have a lot of vendor partners who host different areas of our website, for example. So we did briefings of the personas with them. Um, you know, a perfect example is the whole quotes and research area of our Scott Trade site. Um, we have a third party that helps us with that. And we wanted to make sure that they were leveraging the personas when making design decisions as well. So we've certainly shared them there. One thing we haven't done that I would like to do, um, I hear about companies who will do validation exercises with their external customers. So actually like showing these personas to clients and you know, using that to help kind of validate and evolve them. And I think that's interesting, but we haven't gone that route quite yet. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I'll speak a little bit to how we've made the distinction between our personas and, and segments. So um, one of the challenges with personas is I can't take my personas and map them onto my client database, right? So I get asked the question a lot, how many Andreas do we have? And that's a hard question to answer. Um, whereas with our segmentation models, we can map that onto our database and we know exactly how many fall in each segment. We can target emails based on that. We can send offers to only clients in this segment. Um, so that's, that's the thing that's a little different about the personas and something that we've really had to educate folks about internally. Um, and I, you know, I think they're both incredibly valuable. You know, there are certain situations where segments kind of dictate what I do and others where personas do. That's something we put a lot of focus on, is just making that distinction clear for people. Does that answer your question, or? Uh, well, it depends on how you segment it. Uh, sure. By group, by behavior, by mm -hmm. category. Yes. Um, you are right that with segments, you can know how many answers you have. Mm -hmm. The one difference is that with a persona, uh, it's a person, again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. person. So we are dealing yeah. with humans at the end of the day that the segment becomes a person. Sure. Yep. And that's interesting you mentioned that about the survey because one of the things we are doing, um, we do a lot of usability testing and other forms of research at Scott Trade, and we have a recruiting process, right, to find the right types of clients to bring in. And so we have ex start, started to explore developing a set of questions that we can ask people to identify whether they might be an Andrea or an Owen or one of our other personas so that we're bringing people in to evaluate a product that match our target you know, persona for that. So that's something that we're, we're working on now. Yes, absolutely. So we actually launched a new um, area last year, Scott Trade Investment Management. Um, so we are now offering advice products, which is a first for Scott Trade. It used to be that we only cater to self-directed investors. So that's a perfect example because we have not yet done research or evolved our client persona set to account for this new type of client that we're trying to attract, who wants to delegate their finances to us. So I imagine in the coming year, we'll probably dig into that, and that will be one way we evolve our personas. Um, another example was with mobile 
that I spoke to, we're kind of adding an additional layer to them. But certainly, um, we, we have plans to make sure that we revisit on a regular basis um, so that as the business evolves, our persona sets evolving as well. And also as technology evolves, because yes. we even, we're doing the, I'm doing the analysis for the mobile piece right now, and you know, we did the rest of the research about a year ago, and I can even see a difference in how people are using mobile just in the past year. So obviously, we've got a lot of technology advances that we need to keep into consideration when you're looking at something with like Scott trade across multiple channels. Yes. Oh, yes. Explain how you decided on accommodating and then uh, how you selected the different pieces of the interview board around that kind of creative persona that they were able to come up with. Mm -hmm. How you had to kind of go over the same formula to get the number of times that you selected them already, but how did you sure. go about that process? So so I'll talk a little bit about the selection of the people and maybe you can talk about ethnography lease. Um, so we actually used our client segmentation to guide that a little bit. We had a lot of conversations with our executives and VPs to say, okay, we want to make sure we're, you know, sampling kind of the right set of people for this research. Um, we had a segmentation model that actually, you know, was a good starting point for that. So we made sure we had representation across our segments. And then we had probably about 30 plus other criteria that Effective UI helped extract from us um, to make sure we were getting kind of that representative set of people so that we could answer that question of, you know, are these representative of our client base? We had a really broad, we were looking for a very broad set of people for this research. And so we did start with the segmentation and then we pulled out all sorts of different characteristics um, and made sure that we, got, we had enough people in the different buckets so that we had a nice representation across a wide spectrum. And then once we got all the data back, then we, that's when we started to create the personas out of them. But it probably, we probably spent an entire like two hours or more going through all of the different uh, spectrums of behaviors that we were looking for for people and then created a screener that we used to recruit all of the people in the three different markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Thanks.